Thanks, Mr. Montero. Uh, Judge Thompson, you said despite 20 years on the bench, it was an intimidating experience to be here this morning. Now you know how I feel day after day in the presence of Senator Grassley. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nina Morrison, I'm glad that you're sitting there and I'm glad that you're being considered for this. You know the line of questions that you will face. Like every human endeavor, our system of justice is less than perfect. We know that innocent Americans have been wrongly convicted. Some have been wrongly executed. The Innocence Project, of which you are an integral part, is an organization which I know personally from my state of Illinois and my hometown of Springfield. It leads in the effort to make sure that the cause of justice is served. Innocent people are exonerated, and the truly guilty are found and held responsible. But of course, it raises the question about whether you can be objective and follow the law when it's inconsistent with some of your previous experiences. So how do you answer that? Thank you, Chair Durbin, for that question. Um, I have been so fortunate to work at the Innocence Project for the last 20 years in my role as an advocate. And um, I think I, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I would take as a model the many judges who, I'm, who I've appeared before across the country, uh, often elected from both Republican and Democratic tickets, many of whom had backgrounds very different from mine as prosecutors or from the private sector, but who gave me a fair hearing, who listened to my arguments and followed the law. Were it not for those judges, many of my clients would not be free today. Uh, and I will take the memory of those appearances with me if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed. Let me ask you about the death penalty. I'm a sponsor of a bill to abolish the federal death penalty. I won't give a speech on it. But the question is, if you are chosen to be a federal judge and face a, a set of facts and allegations that lead you to believe that a person might be eligible for the death penalty? Would you have any hesitancy or second thoughts about imposing it? Thank you, Senator, and no, I would not. Um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the death penalty is constitutional. That puts it into the hands of policymakers like yourself uh, and prosecutors and the citizens who elect them to decide if it should be available as an appropriate punishment for crime. Of course, no one wants an innocent person executed, uh, but the work that I have done over the last 20 years has been in the role as an advocate. The role of a judge is very different, which is simply to ensure that any proceedings before you are constitutional and follow the law, and it would be my honor and my privilege to serve in that role. Thank you. Judge Garnett, you were the lead prosecutor in United States versus Brooks. Mr. Brooks was charged with intentionally threatening to kill then-Senator Barack Obama. During the defendant's arraignment and bail hearing, you observed that he possibly suffered from mental health issues and asked the court to order a psychiatric exam and competency hearing for him. After it was determined that the defendant, in fact, suffered from severe mental illness, you coordinated with the Secret Service, Defense Counsel, Mr. Brooks' family, and state authorities to move to dismiss the case so that Mr. Brooks could receive the mental health treatment that he needed. We are becoming more sensitive and aware of the role of mental health in the commission of crime and uh, circumstances leading up to it. Could you say a word about your thoughts of mental health in the context of today's system of justice? Thank you, Senator Durbin. Um, our system of justice is predicated on the idea that everyone is supposed, or ideal that everyone is supposed to be treated fairly, and that includes individuals who are suffering from mental illness. I have, as a prosecutor and as a judge, I have tried to make sure that individuals who elect to go to trial um, are mentally competent to do so. And when I sat on the Court of Appeals, our three-judge panel also um, issued an opinion which made sure that individuals who elect to represent themselves are also competent to do so. Um, or mentally competent to do so. I think it's an important principle in terms of making sure that everyone is treated fairly. Um, and if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, I will continue to abide by that duty. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Montero, we're limited in time here to the opening of five minutes. And I want to ask a question of Judge Thompson, but I want to also note for the record, uh, your experience in your community, particularly helping young people, 
uh, is one that uh, really has makes a positive impression on me. And I know that you're going to bring the same value system and dedication to justice uh, to this new position uh, if you're approved. So I thank you for being here today. Judge Thompson, you really have an amazing career on the bench, serving as state superior court judge for 19 years and juvenile court commissioner for two years, presiding over thousands of hearings, hundreds of civil and criminal bench trials, and over 150 criminal jury, jury trials. That's an amazing record. I'd like to ask you what lessons from your time as trial litigator and as judge will best serve you as a federal district court judge? Thank you, Senator, for that question. When I was practicing law, one of the things that was abundantly important for me was to adhere to my Sixth Amendment duties, which was to make sure that I was the best attorney I could be for anyone I was representing. I made sure that I learned every aspect of the law. I made sure that I met with witnesses, including victims, because I wanted to be respectful whenever I saw them in court, and so that they would understand my role in the courtroom and not, be, not feel disrespected. When I transitioned onto the bench, before doing so, I met with some of my clients who were incarcerated, and I asked them what would have made the difference, and they said if people said what they meant and meant what they said, and if they could see me, and if they could hear me. If that had happened early on, I might not be sitting in this cell now. And they just asked me to be sure that I meet people where they are as opposed to where I am. I've continued to try to do that. I don't prejudge situations. It's a case-by-case -case scenario. And although I see and have heard over 150 jury trials, each trial starts anew for me. And I tell our jurors I cannot do my job with integrity unless there are participants in the process as well. So I have all deference to the rule of law, to equality and fairness and access. Thanks, Judge. Senator Grassley? Uh, 